What's up in the sky for November with me, lead night sky ranger Jeff. Mercury moves into the morning sky, Jupiter returns to the evening sky, Saturn is still king of the evening, and Venus reigns in the late morning sky. And once again we go through the idiotic changing of the time zone, but at least we go back to normal standard time, which means sun sets and rises an hour earlier which is great for observing the cosmos. Mercury starts the month hanging very low in the western sky at sunset, shining at magnitude minus 0.1 on the 1st. It goes into conjunction with the sun and returns in the morning sky, and by the 30th it rises some 75 minutes before the sun around 0530. Venus joins Mercury in the morning sky, rising at 6 a.m. on the 1st and 6.15 on the 30th. Remember, there is a time zone change in the mix here. October 30th, November 1st is known as All Hallows Eve or Halloween. In keeping with that theme, we are going to visit the Lake of Death, Lacus Mortis, on the moon. Located in the northeast of the moon, the impact that created the lake is ancient and the walls of the lake have collapsed over time, but there is a lot of ejecta on the western side of the west of the lake, making a nice shadow on the 9th, revealing the smooth lava lake. <clears throat> Rising in the middle is Crater Berg with a diameter of 25 miles. It is a relatively young crater with its walls mainly intact with a nice rebound in the middle. Look to the southeast and find two craters that touch Lacus Mortis. Rim Plana is the western one and Mason to its east. These two are relatively older with several smaller impacts inside of them. See if you can spot the Rime Borgs that run from the Lacus Mortis south wall to the west of Crater Berg. Mars is so close to the horizon all month that it is most probably not a target one can acquire anywhere in southeastern Connecticut. It goes into conjunction with the sun on the 20th and moves into the morning sky well after the sun has risen. Our asteroid of the month is Ceres, which can be found in Cetus the Whale, shining at magnitude 8.3. It passed opposition last month. Consult the Minor Planet Center to obtain precise coordinates. NASA spacecraft Dawn found Ceres' surface to be a mixture of water, ice, and hydrated minerals such as carbonates and clay and about one quarter the size of our moon. Dawn visited Ceres in 2015. Jupiter rises in the east at 2300 on the 1st and 2000 by the end of the month. The king of planets will shine at magnitude minus 2.3 brightening to minus 2.5 by the end of the month. The term planet means wandering star and this month the ancients realized something unique about the outer planets that they sometimes go in reverse and so Jupiter goes into retrograde motion on the 11th. This is only explainable by the Earth's orbit of Jupiter being further from the Sun than we are from the Sun. Check out the northern and southern dark bands of clouds, virtually perpetual hurricanes. Take your time and wait for those moments when the Earth's atmosphere permits crystal clear views to see the details of the clouds. Its rotation rate of 11 hours per day means we could see one full rotation of Jupiter in our northern winter. There are several transits of its inner moons and their shadows I will list in the calendar of events. Saturn is well up into the sky at sunset. On the first, look to the southeast, find the moon. Saturn is the bright object to its left and below it. It sets at 0200. On the 31st, Saturn is now to the right of the moon, still below it, setting shortly after midnight. The rings remain virtually edge on at 0.4 degrees and will begin expanding near the end of the month. Shining at magnitude 0.8, at the beginning of the month it decreases by only 0.1 magnitude. Titan makes a transit of Saturn just after sunrise on the 6th. This repeats again on the 22nd. I will list transits in the scheduled events near the end of this video. Uranus reaches opposition on the 21st. 
Look for it rising in the east at 1900 on the 1st and up in the sky by the end of the month. While some people may see it as a greenish planet, it really is bluish. Its four arc second disc will not reveal detail in most amateur telescopes. Neptune shines at magnitude 7.7 .7 to the east of Saturn. Neptune is 2.7 billion miles from Earth with a disc of two arc seconds. View it in the early evening for best views in the southern sky. Look for its distinctive bluish coloring. It's the Leonid meteor shower this month, occurring from the 6th to the 30th, peaking on the morning of the 17th at 15 meteors per hour. There is a crescent moon rising at 0530. Look for Regulus in Leo, and then to see the longer streaks, look about 45 to 60 degrees away from there. The meteorites are associated with Comet 55P slash Temple Tuttle, which entered the inner solar system in 1998. Our Comet of the Month is C2025 A6 Lemon, located in Ophicius in the southwest at sunset. Observe it early in the month as each day it will get closer to the horizon. At magnitude 10, you will need at least a 6-inch telescope to view it. Again, check the Minor Planet Center, Ephemeris, for exact coordinates. Our constellation of the month is Cetus the Whale, and our object of the month is NGC 246, the Skull Nebula, which is fitting in the Halloween genre. It is also known as the Soap Bubble and Voodoo Mask Nebula. You will find Cetus straddling to the southeast, where the Skull Nebula is located in the tail just left of due south and below and left of Saturn. It is 3,500 light years away from us shining at magnitude 8 covering 3.8 arc minutes. Its radius is about two and a half light years. It is a planetary nebula, the result of its central star shedding its outer layer as gravity took over after the fusion process ceased. Interestingly, it is a rare system as it is a trinary system with three stars gravitationally bound together. The question of the month is, what is magnitude? Magnitude was first coined by the Greek astronomer Hipparchus in 135 BCE before the Common Era. He is to blame for the system as he rated 850 stars assigning them brightness from 1 to 6 with 1 being the brightest. Galileo, then using his telescope, discovered that his telescope revealed invisible objects. In Hipparchus's scale, nothing was dimmer than a 6, but Galileo saw dimmer objects and hence 7th magnitude was born. Fast forward another couple hundred years and we need to rate the moon and sun, so the only thing to do was to assign negative numbers. Then in 1856, Norman Pogson put forward the proposition to use a magnitude scale based on 100 times brighter would be 5 magnitudes. The magnitudes that I list are apparent magnitudes, so a blue-white star might be a magnitude 8, apparently, but in actuality its magnitude might be minus 100. However, to throw another wrinkle in this and make it even more confusing, we use a term called absolute magnitude. Absolute magnitude defines an object's brightness if it were 10 parsecs, or 32.6 light years, from Earth. Here is the calendar of events. Here is the orrery. Here is the music I used.
Our dad joke of the month is, what did the astronaut say to the doctor just before takeoff? Time to get my booster shot. So go outside and enjoy the late fall clear night sky.